You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hey, history lover. You're listening to this podcast because you like great storytelling and learning from the past. Airwave History Plus is your ticket to the most popular history shows anywhere with ad-free listening, bonus content, early episodes, and more from 27 top podcasts, including History That Doesn't Suck, The Explorers Podcast, The History of World War II, Queen's Podcast, The Age of Napoleon, and many more. To get your free seven-day trial, go to the Apple page for this podcast and click subscribe. That's Airwave History Plus, the essential audio destination for history lovers. Available now on Apple Podcasts. It was America's first contested election, and unlike today, the issues that were discussed in public were about great questions of public policy and statesmanship. Like, this guy Jefferson, did he use a swivel chair? Or a stationary chair like the rest of us? And there was no foreign interference in elections. No disputes about counting votes after the votes were in. Except... The 1796 presidential election is really the first one. It's the first contested one. George Washington is president. He is elected in 1788, 1792. He's reelected. There's no competition. So you get to that possibility of a third term, and there's this talk. And of course, George Washington is telling people he wants to retire. He's tired of the bad press he's getting. He's tired of the injury that this term that he's serving in government might do to his reputation. And time to get back to Mount Vernon. But he doesn't immediately, in the early part of the year of 1706, let anyone know. Partisans are spoiling for a fight. There's definitely two sides. Administration or anti-administration. Some would call them like Democrats or Republicans who are in opposition. They're centered around Thomas Jefferson. He's not necessarily leading everything. In fact, James Madison is the leader of this faction in Congress. And the big issue that's going to separate people in 1796, not that it hasn't been boiling up on other fronts, is the Jay Treaty. Because the Jay Treaty with Britain, John Jay goes over there, negotiates it, and many feel that it's a capitulation. It's basically making America subject to Britain. Certainly the French interpret this way. We're going to talk about that. But that issue sparks a controversy in Congress, a fight with even President Washington, some bad press for Washington. Partisans are spoiling for a fight, at least getting antsy about the prospect of the other side taking over the presidency after Washington's gone. Benjamin Franklin Bakke, he has a popular newspaper, the Aurora, and he says, it's to be regretted that though Washington's determination to retire has long since been communicated to his confidential friends, the public generally should be in the dark respecting it. Now, Aki is a partisan. He's attacked Washington before, and Washington's read his paper and hates it. But on the other hand, he's not wrong, because Washington is deliberately saving that retirement um, notice so that there's limited time for opposition to his government to develop. We know this because there's a letter between Washington and Hamilton where Washington asks Hamilton's advice and Hamilton thinks says that he thinks it's better to wait till the absolute last moment before the election, like two months before the electoral college meets. I mean, could you imagine these days if that's when a presidential campaign started? Yet, as we're going to discover, a presidential campaign did start and it was very robust. The Aurora goes further. The president was stepping down. It announces it in its newspaper, even without his own announcement, and has required no talent nor imagination to know that the contenders were Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. Each had their admirers. Each had written works of great praise. But also these same works were sources of political embarrassment, especially when mangled. For Jefferson, it was Notes on the State of Virginia, a celebrated work, which argued to some people in France who had misconceptions about America, various points. But he also goes on on a few tangents on 
racial tangents on just some speculative guesses on science and things that can be made fun of. But Jefferson, in this document, also condemns the institution of slavery. That's going to be used against him. Adams writes his defense of the constitutions of the United States. Now, his defense of the constitutions is a a book written to defend, in a similar way, the state constitutions that America has developed in the various states to the nations of Europe and the world, and also to provide a kind of tool book for those who are building constitutions, both a national constitution and constitutions in in their states. It defends checks and balances and other procedures in various state constitutions. But at the same time, he includes a lot of materials. It's almost like a workbook. There were some accusations of plagiarism, but I believe his intention was more to create kind of a workbook of sources. In the course of that, Adams is creating a lot of things that can be quoted and used against him. This is the situation as Washington releases his farewell address. In the words of Fisher Ames, a prominent Federalist and speaker, was like a pistol shot to start the race. Probably some of the most interesting developments that are happening is in the state of Pennsylvania because they're going to have a popular vote. And Pennsylvania at this point has a very strong Federalist, you know, pro-administration, pro-Washington, pro-Hamilton presence. They're going to support national banking. They're going to support better relations with Britain, friendly relations with France, but not, you know, not not to the extent that Jefferson and Madison's and, and the French Republic wants with Federalists, it's a normal, friendly, but normal relationship. Pennsylvania is a strong state for them. They feel really good about it. Philadelphia is controlled by what's called the Junto, which is um, a group of Federalists who just control the various outlets of, of government at this time. And Federalists usually win elections in the city of Philadelphia. They also have very strong communities in York and Lancaster, enough to build up margins to win the entire state. So what they're going to do is propose a system where, look, let's have Pennsylvania vote. And the winners of that vote throughout the state, that they will be extra at-large electors for whoever wins the state votes. Federals think this will help them. This is actually a bold experiment in popular voting. The state of Pennsylvania, where the capital of the country currently is, is organized in wards and politic down to the last artisan against him. It was a big deal. In Philadelphia, there was to be a popular vote, really in all Pennsylvania, a popular vote. Public events dotted the city. People would crowd around the voting areas. Men persuaded one another in streets and in taverns and talked about the election. Mobs would form with French and American flags and roam the streets, shouting. And you didn't have exit polls. But in Pennsylvania, to the Federalist ear, the pro-Adams ear, the shouts were chilling. It was all, Jefferson, Jefferson, and no king, no king. That seemed to outnumber any Federalist shouts that were out there. There really wouldn't have been pro-Adams shouts. No one was shouting for John Adams, at least not in Pennsylvania. If there were any, it would have been anti-Jefferson. Most of the campaigning that occurs in Pennsylvania on the Federalist part don't mention John Adams. He's got a bad reputation. He'd written the defense of constitutions, and out there in the country, there are people miss reading it. We think only today that people's words are are misread and and any passage that Republicans can pull out that might constitute um, a defense of monarchy are used. You've got people going out in the country and, and singing the praises of Jefferson, but also pointing out all the bad things that Adams plans to do. Handbills would fill the streets of Philadelphia, listing the electors to vote for. Also, on the bottom, they had out-of-context quotes of Adams' defensive constitutions. One hater and a member of a local Jefferson club from Philadelphia rides 600 miles around the state, speaking to as many people as can, almost personally trying to elect Jefferson on his back.
I was on my horse before the sun rose for three weeks, John Smith says. He's a hatter from Philadelphia. He distributed thousands of handbills. No crowd was too small for him. If he saw three people in a town, he would go speak to them. He saw a crowd for a funeral in Northampton County in a church. And before the congregants were dismissed, he got up and spoke about Jefferson. Smith also followed two Federalist riders that were distributing handbills for their ticket. And as they left a town, he would pick those handbills up. So when you hear about lawn signs being stolen today or posters being defaced, billboards being defaced, just know that it has a long history in the American Republic. Some states like Pennsylvania had votes. Others like New Jersey or South Carolina or New York, they just had the legislature pick the electors. But it was busy and some Americans like Oliver Wolcott, Federalist, is already reporting that people I've known for a long time were acting differently during the election period. But it's also a national election. And so there are separate campaigns for votes in the state of Virginia, the state of Maryland. We'll talk about that. And also South Carolina. And South Carolina is an interesting place to be a swing state. We normally think of Jefferson and that Republican, early Republican party of having the South. But actually in the 1796 presidential election, South Carolina is what we might call a swing gets a little complex because at this time when the Electoral College meets us before the 12th Amendment, electors are going to vote for two people, not specifically vote for a president and a vice president. So that's going to have interesting effects in both this election and the next one. South Carolina is very much a swing state. Um, The Federalists control the planter community, the wealthy elite, Um, the areas around Charleston, you know, very strong Federalist connections. But they also have ties to Jefferson, especially through a South Carolinian, uh, Edward Rutledge. They also are participating in a plan that Alexander Hamilton has concocted that perhaps if they support Thomas Pickney, recent uh, governor of South Carolina, very popular there, and recent ambassador to England, if they support him, maybe Federalists can actually get Pickney elected instead of Adams, who is supposedly the candidate of Federalists. It is from South Carolina where the imagined Jefferson presidency hoped to get its eight votes and then perhaps eight second votes for another Republican and attack comes which can only be described as an 18th century hit piece. William Lawton Smith, congressman, pamphleteer, very strong in his opinions. He's also what we would call a race baiter who would sink to to, to low levels in his political warfare. Um, He would go on political tirades opposing Quakers and abolitionists. He's a congressman. Father-in-law was Ralph Izzard. A South Carolinian who is an Adams friend, very strong Federalist. Smith is going to do something which is very common in this period. He's going to both invest in U.S. securities and serve as a congressman and support the assumption of revolutionary war debt, which is going to help those securities. Here's the tact as a little dandy, even by other Federalists in South Carolina, and as a mouthy congressman by Republican opponents. But he always struck back. And he not just argued with other congressmen in the chamber, but if he was out on the streets of Philadelphia or Charleston, say, and he saw just a, 
average person reading the opponent's newspaper, you know, the National Gazette or the Aurora, he would actually get in their face and tell them that the source of news they were reading was biased. And more and more than that, it made them stupid. I can only imagine. Uh, of course, criticism of a news media is nothing new there, right? But I can only imagine it. Well, I guess there's been examples of congressmen doing that on, on Twitter and other places. Uh, he creates a very acid pamphlet. Uh, we would, he would call Thomas Jefferson many insults. And it's called the pretensions of Thomas Jefferson to the presidency of the United States. He actually writes it in 1792, thinking Jefferson will run then, and he revises it for 1796. He attacks Jefferson in several ways that are not going to be helpful to him getting votes, particularly in South Carolina. He accuses the former Secretary of State of being a visionary. Now, you have to understand, in uh, these days, that's like someone being a victim of hallucinations or an unstable crazy man or something like that who can't separate the dream world from the real. They didn't see visionary uh, in the same light that modern Americans do. And he was ambitious. That was another accusation. You know, we like that now. But as I talked about at length in the podcast about don't run for president, that wasn't something that they liked them. He was responsible for all the partisan politics in the land, too, by uh, William Lawton Smith's pen. His words, Jefferson's words, may have started the French Revolution, the, re- the revolution and all the blood. That was Jefferson's offspring. After all, he was their ambassador to France. I mean, there's absolutely nothing to support these allegations. He also says he was a, he's a fake scientist with a knack for mechanics, a philosophical patriot. That's another thing, ph- philosopher, that wouldn't be too positive for a lot of like, say, hardworking, industrious businessmen. Smith hit a little closer with some criticisms that we might even, you might even see made of Jefferson today, that his, all his talk about democracy was just a flimsy veil and compared to the evidence of aristocracy that he lived in. His religious views or his irreligious views were attacked. No one had ever seen, Smith said, Jefferson in a place of worship. And if he's elected to the presidency, Tom Paine, who's a prominent atheist and and wrote books at this time, would be at his table. He would be back in the House of Government again. He even made fun of his looks. He said that Jefferson looked like a curious, tall, and awkward bird, which hides its head behind a tree and supposes itself unseen. Both a reference to his appearance and, again, that Jefferson is the source of all partisan politics. No, you this. They attack the chair that Jefferson sits in. Hey, history lover. You're listening to this podcast because you like great storytelling and learning from the past. Airwave History Plus is your ticket to the most popular history shows anywhere with ad-free listening, bonus content, early episodes, and more from 27 top podcasts, including History That Doesn't Suck, The Explorers Podcast, The History of World War II, Queen's Podcast, The Age of Napoleon, and many more. To get your free seven-day trial, go to the Apple page for this podcast and click subscribe. That's Airwave History Plus, the essential audio destination for history lovers. Available now on Apple Podcasts. See, Jefferson was using kind of a whirling chair. Uh, this is the same swivel chair that we use today, right? We go back. I'm recording in, in, in one of them. But uh, this time it was a big invention. And oh, how pretentious he was in his chair rolling around. It would allow the person to move without moving his tail. See, forget the fact that this wonderful chair Smith is making fun of is something that Washington had too. Jefferson got one after he saw that Washington had one. And then Smith engaged in his usual race baiting as well. He said that Jefferson had dared to write a letter to Benjamin Bonamaker. This is a African-American architect and city planner. And Smith quotes his letter that he's praising him. So it's like Jefferson's a hypocrite. He's also a dangerous radical. Everything's in this pamphlet. And of course, he both attacks Jefferson a bit for his views on race. So abolitionists North can read it, who might be Federalists. And then for those Southerners, he says, well, you know what's going to happen if you elect Jefferson president. He's going to use his alleged influence with French radicals in Paris, the same ones that started 
the revolution in the island that we know now, now know as Haiti, even though these people in Paris had nothing to do with it. He's going to use the same influence to do that to the South. There'll be a slave rebellion here if Jefferson's elected. Then, attacking his term as governor of Virginia, he fled from safety, from a few light horsemen. Well, that's okay. If uh, Jefferson was getting attacked, so was Adams. Opponents were pulling apart his defense of the U.S. constitutions and finding things that were said, like a limited monarchy is still a republic. Wealth, birth, family pride form the best men. Kingly government is best. Of course, this was a passage where John Adams was attacking tyrannical kings, like tyranny, versus more kingly government. But they pulled this little line out. The English Constitution was a blessing. Let's see, it was a blessing before you had anything else. He wasn't comparing it to America. The poor destined to labor. Rich must be preferred in office. Men of property are finest for service. These are all quotes that are going around that uh, they're pulling from, uh, from Adam's work. Yet one other event stands out in 1796, and this could have a historical analog. I talked about it a while ago, but it's worth repeating. And that is the letter of Pierre-Auguste de Day, the French ambassador to the United States. Now, he really shouldn't be getting involved in elections, but he does. And he sends a letter to Secretary of State Timothy Pickering. Right, different from that presidential candidate. This is a Pickering, but uh, Secretary of State. But first, he actually sends it to a newspaper in Philadelphia, the Aurora. This is a Republican or pro-Jefferson newspaper. And he says, look, the United States has done a treaty with Britain. This is the Jay Treaty. And you've basically made yourself subject here. You're not neutral anymore. You've given up to them. So I'm letting you know, as the French ambassador, that we're going to subject you to the same things that you're going to be subject to from Britain. You know, we're going to uh, mess with your shipping. We're going to mess with your sailors and all of these things. Your rights aren't going to be protected. But if the American government were to change in this election, I'm sure France might think differently. Pickering is going to write a letter back to him. He's a federalist. He's pro J treaty. He's going to tell him where to go. But um, for many people, this message is getting out to the citizens of Philadelphia, and it's rallying some and scaring others. Appeals not only to their fears, but also to the previous Franco-American relationship. I mean, a day is going to ignore for the moment that he's now in a government that's revolutionary, and the government that supported America was uh, a monarchy. This government has overthrown. But here he says, Men still exist who can say, An Englishman slaughtered my father, or my wife tore her bleeding daughter from the hands of an unbridled Englishman. You can just imagine, you know, this is Pierre Aday, and I approve this message. It's negative, but it really works, and so does the threat of war that he insinuates in, fur in further letters. And... He also tells French citizens in Pennsylvania to wear the cockade in their hat. And if they don't, you know, sort of threatens them. <laughs> they could lose their protections, the Republic. So, however, it's more than just French citizens who do, many of them do live in Philadelphia. It's a very popular city with uh, French people at this time. But also citizens of French in Pennsylvania who are sympathetic to the French and anti-British wear the cockade as well. So you'll see in the streets while people are voting, there is this, you know, there are people with these French flag cockades. This is all enough to scare merchants who, many of them are Quakers, pacifists, don't want a war, don't want their business interrupted, into voting for Federalists. There's an election just a month before where the Federalists win statewide. In this election, the presidential contest, the Republicans will win statewide. It's a couple hundred votes. People having spoken, all of the electors of Pennsylvania are pressured to vote for Jefferson. So a day's action is probably seen today as a horrible interference of a foreign government, right? Now, it's not without consequences because in New England, where there is a little bit of a contest starting between Republicans and um, Federalists, they rally towards the Federalists and John Adams, and he's going to get the electoral votes of that region. The Connecticut Current writes... The French have made their preference known. There should be no reason to vote for Jefferson now. In fact, 
Uh, some Federalists call on Jefferson should resign because he's obviously corrupted by this foreign government. Oliver Wolcott says, you know, he should abjure his candidacy for the presidency. Losing Pennsylvania was a big deal for John Adams and put him close to losing. And there's going to be 10 men that become important in saving him and making him president. But uh, Jefferson comes pretty close to being the second president in American history. And that would probably mean that John Adams wouldn't get a chance again. So the first of those 10 men, let's take seven of them. And they are the seven Maryland electors that vote for him. So it's very important to note that Adams would not be elected without votes from slaveholding regions and slaveholding electors. Because often we see that, you know, the, the advantage of Jefferson was that he had the support of slaveholders. Well, you know, Adams isn't getting the presidency without the regions of Maryland that are slaveholding. In, in Maryland is split in Baltimore, where there are mechanics that can be organized. The Republicans have it. Jefferson's getting the electoral votes there. On the east shore of Maryland and in the areas around the capital, or what is to be the capital, you know, Georgetown, this is Adams' country. Adams gets a real break in this state. William Vance Murray is a congressman from Maryland, and he was also a law student in London when Adams was the minister there. And he was a frequent guest at John Adams' house in London. And also, he kept a correspondence with him. He's a young congressman. He's getting into politics. He's a federalist. He believes in what John Adams does. And John Adams was something of a mentor to him. This is going to pay dividends in the 1796 election because Murray is going to work hard for Adams. He's going to write letters in several newspapers. Sometimes he uses different pen names so he can write two letters in the same newspaper. He's going to write, news, write in newspapers all over the state. He's going to convince other electors to go along with Adams. He catches wind of a plot that um, Hamilton has to perhaps put Thomas Pickney in as president. Thomas Pickney is like a nobody from South Carolina, but, Ad, but Hamilton figures if he can get that South Carolina votes for him, he'll actually get Pickney's president instead of Adams. So it never comes to fruition, but even if it does happen, Williams Van Murray is on the case. He tells everyone to, again, just as the Virginia electors had done with Burr, to throw away their votes, vote for a different candidate than Pickney. More than that, William Van Murray is going to defend John Adams. He's going to be the explainer. So all of that hate that's going out about uh, John Adams and his defense of Constitution, he's writing letters in Maryland explaining, like, do you realized that what he was writing about was state constitutions in America and defending them and defending the, the, the Republican state constitutions that the country had developed after the revolution and their various systems of checks and balances. He's a Republican. He's just not a Jeffersonian and, and, and arguments like this. And then also attacking Jefferson. Do you realize that Jefferson as governor of Virginia couldn't even defend his home state from invasion during the revolution and had to retreat. The work of Murray and the votes of the Maryland electors are critical. Adams gets seven electors from Maryland and would not win without them. But when you look at the electoral map of a 1796 election, you're always going to see something interesting, and that's that states that go for Jefferson, three of them are going to have little circles in them that have one Adams elector each. So there's three people that are actually significant, uh, three electors, for that 1796 election. One is an elector from York, Pennsylvania, who even though the state goes for Jefferson, it really is by a small margin, his area went for uh, him as a Federalist and a, and a known Adams supporter. He votes accordingly. So that's one vote. Then there's an elector from Cape Fear area of North Carolina, where there is a lumber business, and it's very important to trade with Great Britain in that business. He's an avowed Federalist. He votes for Adams. And finally, there's an elector in the northern part of Virginia, the Alexandra area, that is a Federalist, does not like Jefferson, even though he's the native son in that state. Um, northern Virginia being different politics than the rest of the state, yeah, goes all the way back to the first contested election. Those three votes, absent that, it goes to the House of Representatives. 
And in the House of Representatives, that was currently controlled by the Republicans and likely is a Jefferson win. So if you ever seen a electoral map of 1796, now you know what you're kind of looking at. Of course, this fragile electoral result would collapse in 1800. He's going to face, Adams is going to face Jefferson again. And the opposition will be better organized. Burr is going to be better organized in New York, carry that state, and the rest is history. Adams wins that 1796 election, but for someone who is Washington's vice president and associated with him, it's a bare win. A narrow squeak is what Adams calls it. Here's what Jefferson says about the election result. I never doubted the result. I knew it was impossible. Adams would lose a vote north of the Delaware. He writes to another, it seems probable from the papers that the second call, meaning the vice presidency, will fall on me as between Adams and myself. The vote has been little different from what I expected. But indeed, there are two elements of the 1796 election that do become very interesting and they're really like kind of post-election quirks and glitches. Okay, and the first one and most important is what happens in Pennsylvania. So in Pennsylvania, they made that decision. We talked about that earlier, that Federalists start with thought would benefit them, that whoever wins the entire state's votes wins. And they knew they could pull up these huge majorities, and they do, thousands of votes in Lower, in uh, York and Lancaster. And the other areas of the state are, are Republican, but not well populated. But something changes, and that's that the Philadelphia city area and the Philadelphia county area, but particularly the city turns Republican unexpectedly. That and the western counties turns the election for Jefferson only by about 300 votes in the state. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation, Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. But what happens is it takes time for the Western counties to come in. And the electors are meeting. And Thomas Mifflin, who's the governor of the state, has a decision to make. You know, you're really getting some notes of Bush v. Gore here. But the interesting thing is Mifflin is a supporter of Jefferson. He he's, would be considered like a Republican at this point. But he does not want to be seen as biased. He has a career in Pennsylvania. He's not, you know, the national election's not his preference right now. So using the vote totals that are in without those votes from Greene County in the West, Federalists are ahead. So he decides to allow two at-large electors in. The two at-large are assigned to the Federalists. Then the results from Greene County come in, and it's known. One of them, Samuel Miles, decides, now the, now the votes from Greene County come in, it's see Jefferson had won the state. He said, okay, I'm voting for Jefferson in the Electoral College. The other elector is a Federalist and decides not to. This makes people mad on both sides. Um, one uh, Federalist sees what Samuel Miles does and says, I did not, you know, he's not there to think. He's there to act. And this is a common quote about electors that if there's ever a faithless elector situation, you're going to see. The other elector decides, I'm a Federalist. I'm just voting for Federalist. And that angers Jefferson. He's like, he's almost tells a friend, like, we're lucky that um, we lost the election because it would have been a very disagreeable question that might have arisen if this one Federalist elector, the governor invited, but shouldn't have been there by the votes, 
voted Federalist? A very disagreeable question. There's one other controversy. John Adams as vice president counts the votes when they're received in Congress as part of a joint committee of the House and Senate. So he's presiding. And the votes of Vermont are contested. What's the reason? It's, it, it has to do with um, the way electors were chosen and that the, the authority for how Vermont chose its electors had expired per their constitution. And many Republican newspapers are pointing this out. Those votes go to Adams, but perhaps they shouldn't because they're disputed. That's three votes, enough to turn the election. Now, this is embarrassing for Adams, but what does help him is Jefferson writes a letter to Madison, who's in control of the Congress, who would make a big thing about this in opposition, and says, let the intent and not the form of the law prevail in this case. A less generous person, and Jefferson's going to write several letters that make it clear, maybe he didn't want to be president, right? Um, All of those things, a person that might be more ambitious in seeking the presidency might have made a much bigger deal about what happened. But so goes the election of 1796. I want to thank you for listening, and thanks so much for supporting the podcast. Think about, we have the Patreon site, so the Patreon is simply the letters of my history can beat up your politics. It's patreon.com slash M-H-C-B-U-Y-P. Check it out. And uh, if you can support the program, great. If not, you know, tell someone about the program. Give us a review. Uh, tweet at me at, uh, at myhist, at M-Y-H-I-S-T. We have the Facebook group, Fans of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Hey, history lover, you're listening to this podcast because you like great storytelling and learning from the past. Airwave History Plus is your ticket to the most popular history shows anywhere with ad-free listening, bonus content, early episodes, and more from 27 top podcasts, including History That Doesn't Suck, The Explorers Podcast, The History of World War II, Queen's Podcast, The Age of Napoleon, and many more. To get your free seven-day trial, go to the Apple page for this podcast and click subscribe. That's Airwave History Plus, the essential audio destination for history lovers. Available now on Apple Podcasts.